Good afternoon, everybody. As the Vice Rector for uh, Research and International Affairs, I would like to welcome you all to today's lecture towards deep learning for amortized infer inference of AGI strength safety guarantees. Delivered by one of the pioneers, the pioneer of AI, Professor Joshua Benjo. A special welcome to you, Professor Benjo, and thank you for accepting our invitation to speak at the university today. With its ability to change how we analyze data and process the results to make strategic decisions, AI has a transformative potential similar to or greater than the agriculture or the industrial revolution. It is a new frontier with tremendous potential that needs to be harnessed. University have a, universities have a responsibility to accompany and shape transformations. And the University of Vienna intends to do this for AI. We're confident that we can do it thanks to the variety of disciplines represented at our university, ranging from mathematics to psychology to social sciences to law. Importantly, as the institution that educates the largest number of teachers in the country, the University of Vienna can play a major role in how society perceives, understands, and accepts AI. If we want to make an impact, however, even a large comprehensive university like ours will need to join forces with other institutions in Vienna and in the country. And this is part of the strategy we have elaborated for the next four years. We expect the Faculty of Informatics to contribute significantly to this strategy. And with this, I will hand over to Dean Wilfred Ganser and enjoy the talk and the discussion. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Vice Rector Paccarini. Uh, as Dean of the Faculty of Computer Science, I would like to extend a very warm welcome in the name of our faculty. I'm very happy to see all of you here. And thank you very much, Joshua, for giving us the opportunity to enjoy your lecture. This lecture, and I want to mention this in this occasion, is the first highlight in a very special year for computer science at the University of Vienna. The year 2024 marks actually 50 years of computer science education at the University of Vienna. And at the same time, it marks 20 years existence of the Faculty of Computer Science. So we have a very special year this year. And of course, we want to celebrate this. On the one hand, we celebrate 50 years of, I think, impressive development. But at the same time, of course, we look forward. And we want to reflect on opportunities and challenges ahead of us. When we talk about opportunities and challenges for computer science, then, of course, currently, artificial intelligence clearly is a topic which immediately comes to mind. I have heard the opinion that in this topic, computer scientists are more part of the problem than of the solution. However, I invite you, and you will be able to judge yourself in about an hour, our speaker today is clearly an outstanding counterexample counter for this. In my humble opinion, because of the need for the deep understanding of underlying principles, concepts, and mechanisms, computer science has to play a central role in making sure that the potential of AI te technologies is used for and not against humanity. Of course, for finding good solutions to these very complex problems in the context of AI, it is absolutely required to join forces and to bring together expertise from many different disciplines. And precisely this, bringing together expertise from many disciplines across the University of Vienna, is one of the objectives 
of our research network data science. And I would like to invite its speaker, Thorsten Müller, to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. It is my privilege and my pleasure to introduce to you Joshua Bengio today. Um, as you may know, he's uh, received the ACM uh, Turing Award in 2018 together with Jeff Hinton and Jan Le Kuhn for his pioneering work in deep learning. Um, if you may not know, but uh, the Turing Award is sort of the highest prize that a computer scientist can receive. Um, he also received the Killiam Prize in Natural Sciences. Uh, if you know a little bit about Canada, that's also a very high honor uh, in Canada. He has become a fellow of the Royal Society of London and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, he was named Radio Canada Scientif Scientist of the Year in 2017. Uh, he's a knight <laughs> of the Legion of Honor of France. Um, he's an officer of the Order of Canada um, he's an IEEE CIS uh, neural networks pioneer. Um, he's not been knighted yet, but we'll see. <laughs> um, he was appointed in tw uh, last year uh, um, to be a member of the UN's Scientific Advisory Board for Independent Advice on Breakthroughs in Science and Technology. Um, and, uh, however, he started uh, at McGill University where he became uh, a PhD, where he finished his PhD in 1991. Uh, he then did uh, two postdocs at MIT on statistical learning on sequential data and at AT&T uh, Bell Labs um, on learning and vision algorithms. Uh, in 1993, he joined the University of Montreal. Um, and uh, he became very actively uh, and took part in 2022 um, on the conception of um, Montreal Declaration uh, for the Responsible Development of AI. Um, I love numbers, um, so I want to tell you a little story. Uh, um, Joshua is uh, uh, the most cited computer scientist. Um, and uh, his 80, uh, 800 uh, plus publications garnered roughly 780,000 citations. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, the next person computer scientist uh, there um, has about half of those citations. Now one has to be careful, those are just numbers, um, but I think his achievements uh, in any way are outstanding. Um, but uh, one of his most significant papers, his 2015 Nature paper on deep learning, uh, garnered almost 80,000 citations. Um, and also his work on GANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Networks, um, uh, received about as many citations as well. To put this in perspective, um, he published about 20 papers, uh, and each single paper uh, garnered uh, more citations than my whole body of work. Um, however, uh, he's here today to talk about his revelations on the future of AI and how unprepared we are to face them. Uh, it's an extreme pleasure um, to welcome uh, my fellow countryman, Joshua Bengio. Please join me in welcoming him. Right. Thanks for all these uh, words. Um, I'm humbled and honored uh, by by all these um, uh, nice things you said. Um, let me talk about where we are first in the frontier of AI, and then you know, what this could mean for where we are going. So, as you probably know, if you've played with some of the generative AI tools. Uh, we have systems that can generate very credible text, images, sounds, including speech, including uh, Im imitating my speech. And like, uh, when it's yourself, it's different. Um, when you're saying something you wouldn't say in particular. And now more and more videos is just starting. And of course, videos are much more convincing and, it's, and thus much more dangerous. 
Uh, it could be fun to have all these tools. The problem is what we do with them. Um, another area of significant progress, if you're not aware of, um, is uh, the ability of these systems to program. Um, there's already, I don't know, 30 or 40% of GitHub uh, programs that are, you know, were generated by AI. Right now, they're not as good as humans. Uh, I mean, they're not as good as the best humans, but they're as good as many programmers. Um, again, you know, what's going to happen uh, when we have AI systems that can program better than most, uh, almost all programmers? Um, language is the obvious breakthrough that happened uh, recently. Um, and I've been, you know, uh, really lucky over the last uh, 25 years to be part of that with some of the work we did in my group. But I did not expect us to be where we are today with systems that can fluently manipulate language, um, seem to understand what they're talking about, sometimes say crazy things, but overall um, uh, express themselves and can and, uh, you know, capture information from text in, in ways that um, uh, most people would have judged uh, essentially passed the Turing test. Turing, uh, the, maybe one of the founding fathers of computer science, uh, thought a lot about AI and, and he said, okay, so if one day we have machines that can, uh, we can interact with, interact with um, through text and we can't make the difference whether it's a human or a machine. Uh, that, that will be meaning we have achieved human level AI. Of course, he was wrong, uh, as in we can interact with a machine and, and it could fool us, but, but it still is lacking some important aspects. So if we ask the right questions, we can find that these systems actually are not very good at reasoning. Well, so are many humans. Um, and they um, also say all kinds of uh, wrong things with high confidence, so are many humans. Um, they, uh, they're behaving a little bit like humans who don't think through what they're saying, like many humans. Um, it's like uh, they have very strong intuitions, but they don't have uh, the kind of uh, inhibition and ability to um, uh, think about what you're saying so that this is what I and others call system two capabilities um, as developed as some of us do. But what's next? Well, many companies are uh, publicly saying their goal is to build machines that will be as smart or smarter than us, also known as AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. Um, and there are still people who ask me, well, is that even possible? Well, of course, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but there is no reason to think that it's not possible. Your brain is a machine, a very complicated one. We don't fully understand it. We're making progress. But clearly, we, we see a trajectory of progress towards human level intelligence. And so from the point of view of um, decision making, public policy, um, we, we have to prepare for the possibility that we reach uh, AGI at some point. And what does that mean? Um, so here's some curves of progress over the years from around 2000 to now over different machine learning benchmarks in uh, various uh, tasks from you know, speech to mathematics to uh, language abilities. Um, and you can see it's, you know, the, the best systems are getting better and better. The dark line is uh, human performance. And in some cases, we are seeing these systems apparently surpass humans. Uh, you can also see the curves on the right. They're rising faster than they used to. So there is. Uh, there seems to be an acceleration. And of course, we don't know what the future would look like in terms of scientific progress in AI, but there's now um, on the order of $100 billion per year invested uh, in trying to bridge the gap between humans 
I mean, between machines and humans. Um, and if you ask in polls, or you, if you ask, for example, the three Turing awardees of uh, deep learning, uh, when are we going to get AGI? You get answers that give you a span from a few years to a few decades, roughly speaking. Um, maybe the median is like 10 years or something. Um, so that's very quick, and it could be five. And they, even lots of people in those companies building the systems that say it could be even three. Um, if that's true, we are completely not prepared. Um, and we need to really think through what, what, what may happen. Because with in great intelligence comes great power, but not necessarily great wisdom and great um, uh, responsibility. Um, so we have to be very careful about what we are building, what we are wishing for. Um, you can see in this that where we stand right now is at an era where we have machines that know a lot. Actually, it was one of the points here. Um, we have machines that either know a lot, like GPT-4, or are really good at planning and reasoning, like AlphaGo. And the main thing that's missing is bringing these two abilities in one system. So being able to reason about a uh, very uh, broad set of facts and, 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 and knowledge about the world uh, is where you know it could really change things um, to approach uh, or, or surpass human level. Um, there are lots of concerns that computer scientists, but, but also social scientists have been expressing about what may come with these uh, advanced abilities in, in the coming years, or even short term. Um, but you know, some of the things include uh, the effect on the labor market, um, people being replaced by machines. In fact, this is the thing that is worth the most to companies right now. Create products that can automate part of the work that humans normally do. And so that's where it, that they're mostly busy doing right now, uh, the companies. They're trying to replace humans by machines. Uh, and it's worth a lot of money. Um, personally, I think we could use AI in uh, socially more beneficial ways by focusing on AI to help scientists solve problems, um, but it's not as profitable in the short term. All right. Um, so over the last year, various risks uh, that I'll talk about associated with AI have become a global concern by many international organizations uh, from you know, the World Economic Forum, the uh, IMF, uh, the UN, the OECD, um, I'm involved in um, a kind of IPCC report on AI safety that follows the UK AI safety summit that took place last November. And we're trying to bring together all the pieces of scientific evidence about the various risks that are in front of us. But let's, let's try to dig a little bit uh, more into why there are risks and what kinds of risks and fundamentally, as I said before, intelligence gives power. The question is, how is that power used? Um, really, what intelligence is about is the ability to achieve goals and answer questions. And then who decides what the goals are and what the questions are, right? If, if there are good goals, then we could do things that are beneficial to humans. If there are bad goals, then they can harm um, individuals or, or uh, our societies, our democracies. Uh, so fundamentally, AI is dual use like many technologies, but what you have to add to this equation is the more powerful it gets, the more good things it can bring, and at the same time, the more bad things it can bring, depending on how we collectively choose to use it, or some people choose to use it. Now, you could think that AI is like, well, just another technology, another tool that humans are building. But, but I think that works for many questions, but then there's this extra thing that make 
makes AI potentially very different, which is the possibility that we eventually build machines that fend for themselves, that have as one of their major goals to preserve themselves. Every living thing on this planet has a self-preservation goal, I mean, implicitly, at least. Otherwise, evolution would have called those species. That is what uh, I, I believe is the defining property of living things. And it doesn't have to be biology. It could be machines that have those properties. So how could such a self-preservation goal emerge? Well, there's a very, very simple path. Humans decide to build machines that are going to be like us, and so machines that have um, self-preservation instinct. If, if you think about, you know, chat GPT, you tell it, you know, do this, do that, you know, tell me how to do this. It would be, it could be as simple as that, that somebody decides once we have AIs that are sufficiently smart and autonomous to also give them the goal of preserving themselves. So why would they do that? There are people who think that um, it wouldn't be a bad thing if humanity was replaced by superhuman machines. I think most humans, especially those who have children, would disagree, but it's enough that a few crazy people do it. Then there are other ways that self-preservation could emerge as a side effect of um, the way we are training them. And I'll give some examples of that. Um, related to this, and behind those you know, um, unintentional uh, dangers of um, losing control of machines, or having them uh, do bad things that we don't want is the problem of alignment and control, which I will explain. But fundamentally, the issue is right now, AI science doesn't have an answer to the question, how do we build AI that will not harm people? Uh, whether this harm is you know, ordered by malicious humans, or whether it is because we've lost control. How do we avoid losing control? How do we avoid misuse of AI? We don't have the answers to these questions. And um, I'll argue that this is, some, this is really urgent because uh, we don't know when we're gonna reach the AGI. Um, so it's not like we don't try. Companies want to find solutions to these problems, um, but what they have tried up to now was an utter failure. Um, days after a system is released, some hacker or academic find a way to bypass the safety protections that have been put in place. Um, the other kind of research that is going on in AI safety um, is, I think, very important, but doesn't completely solve the problem. And it's what's called evaluations. In other words, we're trying to see if an AI system, say like GPT-5, which is coming soon, has capabilities that could be dangerous, like helping to build weapons or uh, hacking systems uh, you know, with, with uh, very strong skills, um, or persuasion of humans. And the, 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 the idea is they, they try to ask all kinds of questions to these systems to elicit th those kinds of behaviors to see if they can do those things. Of course, if they discover that these systems have those uh, bad capabilities or dangerous capabilities, then ideally the company would stop uh, you know, working on that system until they find a fix or governments would force them to stop, which yeah, uh, is, is hopefully what the legislations that are coming in place uh, will do. But that doesn't answer the question of how we build safe AI. It only tells us how to recognize that an AI could become dangerous in the wrong hands or if we lose control of it. Um, yeah, and a lot of the progress we make scientifically with AI to increase capabilities, because that's what companies are trying to do, make their systems smarter quickly finds its way into the dark web where criminals can buy 
these abilities for doing all sorts of bad things, um, from child pornography to hacking to um, uh, to to uh, uh, deep fakes and things like that. So such is our world. Um, let me. Um, let me say a few more words about loss of control. So, the the I, I talked about the motivation for an AI to um, to turn against us, uh, but you know uh, uh, some of the um, uh, comments I get sometimes is yeah, but it's just in the computer. Like, how is that going to be bad in the real world? Well, you know. Um, humans will do things if you pay them. Uh, criminals will do things. Um, people can be influenced, so that's persuasion. Key people who take decisions in many organizations, you don't need to, influ to influence everyone, just the right people. Um, there are lots of things that are happening that are completely virtual in, in our world, you know, starting with uh, finance. Um, AIs that are good at hacking computers can potentially copy themselves in many places, so it becomes hard for the authorities or even their designers to get rid of them, to turn them off. But there remains the question of how could they do a lot of harm in the real world? Um, well, if there is enough progress in robotics, and you know it's bound to happen at some point, then AIs that we've lost control of could take control of these robots and then they don't need humans anymore. Because right now they need humans, of course, to provide them with electricity and parts and things like that. So let's see how, let's see a scenario that I, I, I consider worrisome. Um, how about how the way that we're currently training AI systems to act in the world, what we call AI agents, can actually lead to loss of control. And um, so first, you have to understand that in order to train AI agents right now, what we do is we use reward maximization. We give them rewards for when they behave well or negative rewards when they don't. And the program uh, that is written by humans is uh, about optimizing behavior so as, to, so, as, so as to maximize those positive rewards. So this is similar to how you train your cat or your dog. If your cat you know, jumps on the kitchen table, you may shout at it and it may learn eventually to not do it so long as you're in the kitchen. So this is a misalignment. You have an intention Cats shouldn't be on the kitchen table. The cat understands something slightly different because, well, it has other interests, let's say. Um, something similar has been observed in toy situations with AI systems trained to maximize reward. Um, and this misalignment could be amplified by the, the fact that the AI is trying to maximize its reward. Um, let's consider how things can get bad. Instead of using reward maximization to train your cat, let's say you go to something more powerful than you, like a grizzly bear. So we're getting to the bear. Um, what, um, you know, how could you train a bear to do things that you want? Well, it's more powerful than you, so you, can, you can't just like shout. Um, so you could build a cage to protect yourself and then give it fish when it does the right thing. And it's probably going to work if the cage is strong enough. But if this bear is stronger than you, you might not be able to build a strong enough cage and then it can hack the lock and get out. And then it doesn't care about your intentions. It just wants to get the fish. So. In computers, what that means would be something like the AI taking control of the parts of the computer in which the rewards are recorded or computed so that it can give itself the maximum reward that is possible. 
This is the problem of uh, AI systems taking control of their own reward. Just like an addict, you know, uh, you know shooting themselves with positive uh, emotions all the time. You could say, well, who cares if we have an addict AI? We can just turn it off, right? No, because the AI is smart, unlike the addict whose brain doesn't work anymore, and it wants to make sure it can continue giving itself all these positive rewards forever, which means it not only wants to plan how to escape the cage, but also how to take control of the fish and us so that we can't put it back in the cage or turn it off. So these, these are just speculations, and there's some um, actual computer science analysis and, 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 and you know, theory behind these ideas, but of course we don't know if that's going to happen. But it's just to illustrate how the ways that we know how to train AI systems to do things in the world can turn against us, even though it was not our intention. Um, yeah, let me skip that. Okay, so if we go back a little bit to the big picture here, how do we avoid these catastrophic outcomes from misuse or loss of control? Well, there are two basic things we need to do, and we, get, we need to get both of them right. One is scientific and the second is political. So scientifically, we need to solve this problem. How do we design AI systems that could eventually be smarter than us and act morally, do not harm people, at least do not harm? I mean, like, uh, let's just be humble here. We're not even asking that they do the best possible ethical thing, just do no harm, right? Can we do that? Um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, but but it, even if we are able to do that, it's not sufficient. Right? Even if we know a way to biz, you know, build AI, design AI systems that, that would be the, really be helping us to build a better world for humanity and um, you know, be smarter than us but, but somehow remain tools. How do we make sure everyone on this planet follows those rules. So that's a political problem. We can have legislation, we can have treaties, and we should do it. But also keeping in mind that at some point, somewhere, someone will do the wrong thing, and we need to be prepared for that, which means the possibility uh, that some, you know, in the, some future, uh, a rogue, dangerous AI emerges um, how do we deal with something like that if it happens? We need to prepare for that possibility. And if it's really superhuman, the only way I can see us like, protecting ourselves is with other AI that is superhuman and safe, that does what we want, that we don't lose control of it. But, th but, it, but that is tricky, right? Um, of course, we need to figure out the scientific problem of how do we build such safe AIs, but it's not sufficient. We also need to make sure that um, humans will not abuse that or try to steal it for you know, military purposes or whatever. Um, and how do we make sure that no individual person, no individual company, no individual government would abuse such a you know, superhuman power that could exist in the future. Um, I think we have to, th to be creative and innovate, not just on computer science here, but on uh, political science, social science. Like what kind of governance of the organizations that are gonna be building these things do we need in the future? Um, because AI is going to affect everyone, uh, in both good and bad ways, very likely, everyone on this planet, right? Um, and because we don't want individual governments to have the temptation to use uh, the power that AI could give them, it should probably be something multilateral. Uh, 
involving maybe the UN or some other international organization. And we need to make sure that the decisions about these AIs are not just driven by profit maximization. Because, for example, we're seeing currently a race between the major AI companies where they have to cut corners on safety in order to compete with the other guys. Because the, the companies that, that, have, that offer better capabilities to the public in their products are going to win a larger market share and so on. And, and working on safety is expensive. Uh, you know, in, for drugs, the vast majority of the cost of developing a drug is how to make sure it is safe. And you could expect similar things for AI. Okay. Um, so now let's go to the um, more like scientific questions. Um, until what time should I go on until I, I start, uh, stop for questions? Ten, five, ten minutes? Okay, so, um, yeah, let me skip some slides. It's okay, don't worry. Um, well, a few things for people who know a bit about machine learning. The way we currently train these systems is by what's called maximum likelihood, um, meaning we're trying to find the parameters of a model, like a neural net, that fits the data that we have as well as possible. And that sounds very reasonable. Um, but somehow we end up with systems that are confidently wrong sometimes. And, well, sometimes it doesn't matter, but if we get to these more powerful systems whose actions can be very consequential, <laughs> this could be a problem. And the same thing is observed with the way we train agents, so with reinforcement learning, that, um, um, they, they could take decisions for which they seem to think it is really the right thing to do and, and it could be wrong decisions. So w what is the problem? To illustrate the problem, let me use this uh, little um, kind of uh, toy setting. Imagine you have a robot, an AI, and it has to take a very simple binary decision, either go to the left door or the right door. Right? That's, you can't have easier than that in computer science. And now, based on all its experience, let's say that there are two uh, equally valid theories, equally in the sense that they're equally compatible with the data that, that it could consider. And however, these theories make different predictions about each of the doors. So for example, let's say that in the first bubble in the left, like the first theory says, you go left, somebody's gonna die. You go right, you get some cake. The other theory says, oh, no, 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 go left, you get some cake. Go right, nothing good, nothing bad. All right, let's see who votes for taking the right door. Good. Who votes for taking, well, too late, I said good. Um, so what, what is going on here? Um, what, what has happened is, first, um, we didn't pick just any random theory that fits the data. There are many theories that can fit the data. There's theoretical arguments having to do with causality that even with infinite amount of data, there will remain ambiguity about how the world works. So, you have to understand that the way we currently train these AI systems with reinforcement learning and maximum likelihood really would randomly pick any of the theories that are compatible with the data because for any of these theories, their like training objective would be zero. It would fit the data as well as possible. And of course, if you pick the wrong one, in this case, it could be catastrophic. So to avoid these confidently wrong decisions, we need AI systems that have what philosophers call epistemic uh, humility and can estimate their own epistemic uncertainty. In other words, they know that they don't know. They know that they're not sure what is the right theory here and they will act rationally according to that lack of knowledge. 
And this is not the way that we're currently training AI systems. Um, so in uh, machine learning, we call this kind of uh, approach Bayesian because we are uh, trying to uh, uh, not just fit the data, but, but somehow consider all the possible ways that the data could be fit. Um, so I've come up with a little theorem that um, would actually allow us, in principle, if we can train the neural nets to do the right Bayesian things, to take decisions uh, under a kind of constraint that the AI shouldn't do something bad. Um, so this is a, uh, okay, so what are the entities here? So H here stands for harm, A for action, C for context, D for data, um, and T for theory. So let's forget about the first proposition, but basically the thing we want here is um, the probability that my AI will produce harm if it does a particular action in some context under the true theory, T star, of how things work in the world. Of course, we don't know what is the true theory. It's like, you know, in my example here, I don't know which of these two is correct. But we know some things about it, which is that it is consistent with all the data we've seen before. And because of that, we can, which is what the first proposition is about, um, because of that, we can write uh, this kind of inequality that says we can bound the probability of bad things happening, but the probability of bad things happening according to a theory here, capital T, that we can compute. It is a, what I call the paranoid theory. It's one that is plausible, so it, you know, it has a high probability given the data. It's consistent with the data, and it predicts a lot of harm. It predicts the high probability for harm. So it's similar to, let's say you're driving and you're, you're in this mountain, uh, it's night, it's a small road, in, you know, some, some countryside. And what pops in your mind is something dangerous could happen. Maybe it's unlikely, like there's a truck coming and its lights are not working. And yeah, you don't want to fall in the precipice. So you're gonna drive in a kind of safer way based on this sort of worst case, but plausible scenario. And that's more or less what, what this is saying. Um, in order to make those computations, we would need uh, advances in machine learning methods that don't currently exist, but, but I think are, are feasible. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to you know, not, not go into all of those um, details. But, but in my group, we've developed methods called generative flow networks that give us a glimpse of what may be possible to achieve those Bayesian posteriors. Um, so for those of you who know a little bit about reinforcement learning and generative models, normally we train generative models to sample, uh, say like images, according to a distribution that is specified by um, data. We don't know the distribution, but it's samples from that distribution that we get. So that's the usual machine learning framework. And these GFLO nets, they answer a slightly different question which is, well, how do I train a generative model where the way I specify what it should generate is an unnormalized distribution or a reward function? So we, we would like to generate objects theta with a probability pi that is proportional to some given function. So R of theta is a, is a computer function that we can write, like a reward function that we use for training um, agents. But if you choose that reward function smartly, uh, based on the data, what's called the prior times the likelihood, then your GFLO net uh, will generate these objects theta, which could be theories about the world, um, with exactly the right probability. In other words, the posterior probability given the data. And, and we've shown how this can work in small scale problems. So I, I just show this to illustrate that I think there is hope that we could make advances in machine learning that um, uh, 
could unlock these uh, um, methods that give us quantitative guarantees about the safety of uh, such systems. And by the way, um, this is very different from the general approach to machine learning, and deep learning that has worked, you know, uh, for many dec for a number of decades now, where we we just build systems based on our intuition and then experiments. Oh yeah, it works, so we move on. Uh, but we don't have any mathematical like strong understanding. Just very different from like building a bridge. But if you don't want the build, if you, if you think about bridges, like if you don't want the bridge to fall and you can't afford to run many experiments of build, uh, bridges building, what can save you is mathematics. That, you know, based on some assumptions and some calculations, you can come to the conclusion that the probability that the bridge will uh, not fall is, is uh, very high. And, um, and uh, that's the sort of thing we need for um, safety in AI especially when we get the point that we have machines that are smarter than us. It's only with mathematics that we can get guarantees that an entity smarter than us cannot make a theorem false, right? So if we have a theorem that says with high probability it's not going to do bad things, uh, it doesn't matter that it's much smarter than us. We, we would be in a much better position to keep those machines as tools rather than competitors on this planet. All right. I'll um, I'll stop and give time for questions. Yeah, you can find lots of uh, information about this work um, if you go on my blog, for example. Um, also, I'm trying to build a group that will be developing these methods. So I'm recruiting research scientists and research engineers. Don't don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, questions? Thank you. Um, you said in the beginning that um, brains are basically machines, right? Yes, yes. And many people ask why would AI at some point, AGI stage, would have not have rights, for example. Yeah. And if brains are machines, AIs are machines, and how do you uh, think about this? Why should AI not have rights or have wa rights? And do we need a concept of a soul or something to really argue for this? Yeah. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a philosophic, philosophical question. Well, yeah, no okay, problem. so here's my view. I don't know the answer. Clearly, I don't know the answer about soul. And you know, there are lots of things that could be said about consciousness, which we usually associate with rights. And I think it's a big mix-up. But there's a very practical uh, way of dealing with all this, which is even if there were entities that were, uh, you know, conscious and whatever you want, if they are smarter than us and have their own goals that could, you know, harm us, I don't think we want them here. I mean... We can vote on it. I think I'll win. <laughs> um, but, but different people may have different opinions about this, obviously, right? Um, well, what I would say is, let's not jump into something as tremendous as, as this scenario without understanding what we're doing, because that's the main problem here, right? We, we are racing into a place where these really hard questions are asked, and we don't understand enough um, we don't even understand enough about, you know, what is consciousness and, uh, 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 you know, how is that connected or not to uh, notions of rights, the right to exist, for example. Uh, I think we, we need to spend many more brain cycles on figuring these things before we take decisions that imply, you know, all human future generations. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I have two questions, one for the first part of the talk, that's a rather brief one, and one more, more detailed one about the second part. So in the first part, what do you think are our chances of actually reining them in and being successful in accomplishing what you're suggesting? I don't know. Um, so, you know, if you're following the way of thinking that is Bayesian, you don't give an answer to a question like this. You say, oh, well, I have a distribution over probabilities. And mine, of course, is very flat. That's because I'm fairly agnostic about that question. And, of course, you could average out and say, oh, 20%, but I think that's not very informative. And in a way, it doesn't matter what I think or what you think uh, is the probability that will survive. The only thing that should matter from a uh, uh, like decision theory point of view is if we don't want that to happen, uh, what is it we can do um, to reduce those probabilities, so to make it unlikely that we end up in, in these scenarios that could be catastrophic. So each of us can do something. There are many problems on this planet, and the real questions are like, what can I do to you know, bring about a better world or uh, avoid catastrophic outcomes? Thank you. Yeah. And, and my second question would be about the, the second part, and more a little bit detailed about how we train these systems. Yes. So you're certainly aware of Karl Popper and the Vienna Circle who argued that you need to falsify rather than confirm theories. You need to what? Falsify rather than confirm theories, right? And uh -huh. Karl Popper yes. here in yes. Vienna was one of the people who pushed yes. that. Yes. And I feel a big part of the scientific education for our students is actually teaching people to falsify theories, not to confirm them. Mm -hmm. And maximizing rewards is in a way maximizing kind of your trust in a theory rather than teaching AIs to try to falsify their own theories. Yeah. So Absolutely. How, how does that align? And are there ways to teaching AI systems to kind of That's try That's exactly to what I'm trying theories? to do. So, so the, the, the Bayesian posture, and you know, there are other mathematical frameworks, but it's the easiest to understand, is, is, uh, has a direct correspondence to the theory, you know, philosophy of science and the uh, scientific method. Um, you need to keep like an open mind to all the possible interpretations so you, you need to remain agnostic and, uh, you know, of course, when a the theory is contradicted by experiments, then you can rule it out, but there remains a lot of possible interpretations. And if you just uh, wear blinders, like many of us do because of ego or whatever, um, this is very dangerous because we, we can be overconfident about a particular interpretation. So the, the, the rational scientist keeps open all of these options and, um, and uses that uncertainty to decide what to do uh, to try to falsify you know, as many theories as possible. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So I have a question regarding harm um, in, in yes. the training. Yes, what is harm? I what didn't define it. it. Um, so um, in complex decision uh, situations, often it is that I cannot say, is this really harmful? Yep. Because it could be harmful for some part yep. of the people and could yeah, be yep. beneficial for others. Mm -hmm. How to define that? Yeah, great, great. Well, um, what I think we should not do is the sort of uh, traditional utilitarian or consequentialist approach that says, oh, there, there, is, there is a, uh, you know, uh, a, a function that we should maximize, that you know, humans want. And the reason is we don't know. A, a humans may have very uh, different forms of ethics, and I don't think machines in, in, in the foreseeable future, even if they are smarter than us, should be deciding for us what is right and wrong. We should be the ones deciding what is right and wrong. But wh who is we, right? Of course, different people have different views, uh, different countries, different cultures. So we, we have already mechanisms for answering that question. They are imperfect. Uh, democracy being essentially the prime answer to this. Um, democracy is about aggregating the preferences of everyone into a common social choice. And maybe we disagree with the outcome, maybe the process is not very clean, and we think it should be better, and it should, but I don't think AI should be doing that job. This is a, a job for society, for political science, and, and you know, social science to help us uh, in this process.
Thank you very much for this talk. Um, and those scenarios that you mentioned, they are really, I don't know, it gave me the shivers to think those uh, things uh, through. Um, but um, there are people like Gary Marcus um, that are very against those, um, you know, those, um, those notions that um, um, generative AI really brings us, uh, like is, is going to this AGI level. I didn't and say that. Uh, no, no, uh, no, no, but um, that's my question. So um, um, Gary Marcus is saying uh, it's hitting a wall and there are deeply uh, rooted yeah. flaws in this technology that we're having right now. So that's, that's my question. All right. How would you um, estimate those, um, you know, those critics that's, that are saying the, the highest risk of those technologies uh, are people using it right now in a deeply flawed way because they put too much trust in those um, technologies that can't be trusted yet? Yeah. You know, I've been involved in the issues of uh, human rights and AI for about a decade now. And by the way, the uh, Montreal Declaration for the Responsible Development of AI was in 2017, 18. No problem. Uh, so, of course, we need to deal with the current problems. And um, legislation like the EU AI Act, for example, or the, the, the bill that is proposed in Canada, they're very much focused on, on the current harms, discrimination, privacy, and, and all of the current human uh, rights issues. But, but I have children, I have a grandchild, and I think it's also a human right for them to exist in 20 years from now. So we have to deal with all of the issues. Now, going back to Gary Marcus, and also lots of other people who speak with a lot of confidence about many of the issues I talked about today. I don't know. Like, I, I, if you had asked me before ChatGPT, are we gonna get systems as competent as that using just good old neural nets scaled up? I said, no, of course not. We're missing such important things, right? <laughs> That's what, you know, researchers uh, are always looking for uh, what's missing. But I've, I've, I've been proven wrong in that belief. And so I'll be, it'd be foolish to say, oh, no, no, I'm right, I'm right. Um, the right thing to do is to say, well, it could be that there's something I don't understand here and uh, the, 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 com the combination of many small tweaks, by the way, that is happening and improving every year by, by 30% the efficiency of these systems, including sample efficiency, may be sufficient to bring us to human level intelligence. If, if I had to make like a binary choice, I would go with, go with Gary Marcus. I think we're missing some fundamental things, but I wouldn't put all my money there because like, I don't know. And so we really just have to be humble and say, well, let's prepare for all the cases um, that are plausible. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm really grateful that you pointed out the dual nature of the challenge, that there is like both the scientific problem and then there's a societal scale problem. Yeah. And I think there's even an interaction between the two, right? Oh, that yes. You hinted at that there's like hundreds of billions of dollars deployed every year into increasing capabilities in a way that's not necessarily aligned with like the common good. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts on, so, so it just seems like a massive gap uh, currently. And like, I of course applaud um, people like you trying to build up safe AI um, research. But there's a massive gap between like these kind of, the, the amount of money that we're just talking and the amount of talent that is devoted to these different efforts. Yes. So how can we shape incentives that like more resources are like yeah. flowing in the right direction? So I think there are several possibilities. One of them would be that uh, future AI regulation asks the companies before they can even train those systems and of course deploy them to demonstrate to independent scientists and, and the regulator that their systems will be safe, that will not harm people and you know, um, at least above a threshold of what's uh, tolerated by society. And right now they wouldn't know how to deal with that. So they would s suddenly invest all of their money in AI safety. Like, how do we build AI systems that are safe? So that's one way. I think it might be a very good um, middle term beyond current regulations. Um, but ultimately, 
I think even that is not sufficient because companies find, find loopholes, they influence laws, you know, they, they, we have lots of examples. Ultimately, I think when we get or approach the AGI level, it has to be in the hands of the public. So I talked a lot about governance. Uh, at that stage, we don't need super fast innovation because we already have like magic in our hand. What we do need is make sure that power is not abused. And so I think uh, governments will naturally, once they start understanding the power of these, that these systems will have, they will want to control them. They will, and if they're smart, they will understand that it shouldn't be a single government doing it. That it should be a multilateral effort like I've been talking about. So <laughs> ideally, we reach a point where there's like one AGI project in the world that's going to be safest, and it's governed by some like you know, multilateral international organization that only aims at the common good for the planet and isn't driven at all by uh, the just competition between companies for dominating markets. But that's my dream, right? Um, yes, I think a very important aspect of humans are their emotions. And uh, we talked about intelligence of AI and so, yes. and maybe they can also get emotional. So for example, yeah. uh, uh, ChatGPT will give us another hateful answer one day and uh, right, a very right. friendly answer another day. What do you think about this? Um, you have to understand this is just a side effect of how they're trained. They're trained to imitate how humans respond in a particular text or text and image contexts. And humans, of course, are emotional, so they will just borrow those ways of expressing themselves. Which, does it mean they feel emotions? Um, this is a harder question. I would say no, because it's not tied to um, their, you know, uh, things that could be bad or good for them, their rewards. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't have in the future AI systems that have real emotions. So you have to understand how our emotions, where you know they arise from um, a, a kind of uh, reaction to things very good or very bad that could happen, and different scenarios give rise to different emotions. And that's something that can be applicable to AI systems in the future. So we will, I mean, in, in a way, we already have some AI agents that have like very primitive emotions. Um, connecting to the earlier question about like rights and uh, consciousness and so on, uh, maybe a special kind of emotion here is um, uh, suffering, right? Uh, suffering for us is meaningful. It, it, it pushes us to avoid suffering, which is, you know, something bad for us. It's, it's a signal that something bad for us. We're in a, in a bad situation. We need to escape that situation. It's a very strong emotion. Um, should we create machines that can suffer? I think we can avoid that. But these are choices we can make. And we have to understand those choices. Thank you. I have a <clears throat> Maybe a slightly different question. You have mentioned privacy. Yes. One of your yes, yes, things. yes. Now, <clears throat> for whatever reason, I have been looking at publications about privacy for the last nearly 60 years. Okay? Of, and Much more than me. <laughs> <laughs> and now, the, my question is because we know that privacy today is discussed the same way as it was 55 years ago. Okay. And we are as far along in real privacy as they were as we were 55 years ago. Now the question is, why should AI and the various interests with our corporations, the military you don't even mention, and the government ever be convinced that some of these ideas you have, and I fully support them, actually to be accepted? Well, this is something we, the people, <laughs> yeah, have to express. Able to do it for well, you know, uh, there are lots of bad things that have happened in history. It doesn't mean we shouldn't fight for 
the right things to happen. Um, and by the way, things may be worse in terms of privacy right now for a number of reasons. In particular, one thing that people don't know is that these, these um, large language models, they like read lots of stuff. And especially when they can read the same thing twice, they sort of learn, they latch on these things, they, they basically can learn them by heart. So they will regurgitate things that they have read. And so people are, you know, computer scientists are trying to make them uh, say things that may, you know, should be private uh, that they have read. And uh, so it goes back to where is the training data coming from? So there are lots of like interesting questions from a computer science point of view to try to uh, protect the privacy and make sure the data that is used doesn't contain information that shouldn't be shared. Uh, there are also copyright issues that, that are tricky, that are different, but, but related. And for the military, I didn't talk about it, but I, I did allude to conflicts between nations as something that we should be wary of. And AI becoming very powerful in the future is going to become like a weapon for those who control it. Um, so very obviously, the militaries of various countries are already trying to beef up their understanding of AI. And for now, they're kind of lagging, but but it's going to it's going to become more and more of an issue. And of course, as you probably know, it's already used in the in the you know in the battlefield um, in in the two conflicts that that we know and we have now uh, in Ukraine and and uh, Gaza, Israel. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, first of all. Um, my question would be, you have you presented this vision of multilateral and multinational governance of, you know, enforcement of safe AI. Yes. My question is, what are the mechanisms that would actually make this enforcement work? Is it not yes. already too late because a lot of this thing is, a lot of these things are open source and yeah. it's not clear to me how effective controls on the use of this technology are possible now? Yeah. You guys ask questions that each require half an hour at least, right? Um, okay, so open source, I didn't talk about it. It's a very difficult and complicated subject. But quickly, you know, I've been a huge proponent of open source and of course open science for all my career, but it's not an absolute value. We have to weigh it against the potential negatives and right now, I think the systems that exist uh, that are open source are not creating more harm than good. So they're useful, in including for AI safety. But it's very plausible that at some point, their capabilities are such that they become weapons in the hands of terrorists or whatever, and the, the negatives become you know, more important than, than the positives. But the, the really important question here is who should be deciding, me? Um, the CEO of Meta? No, it should be a, a social choice. It should be a democratic choice because there's going to be pros and cons. All right, now going back to uh, your question about enforcing some kind of multilateral thing. So if, you know, I, think, I think as the capabilities of AI increase, at some point we're going to say no. You know, you're not allowed to share that open source because it's just too dangerous. The same way that if I had uh, the DNA sequence of an incredibly dangerous virus, I shouldn't be allowed to publish it, right? Because now it's very easy to reproduce and create those viruses uh, once you know the sequence. So not all knowledge should be shared. It goes like, it, it hurts me to say this, but that's the unfortunate reality. As to enforcement, well, we can reduce the, the magnitude of the problem by reducing the number of AGI projects in the world because it's, each one of them creates a risk. How do we make sure there are no other projects that, that arise? Well, we need to have one to defend us in case somebody somewhere does the wrong thing. Um, so the enforcement becomes a defense mechanism. Uh, there are also things that people are thinking about in terms of um, hardware control. 
So it turns out that the chips that are at least currently needed to build AI systems, and probably for the foreseeable you know, decade, they are built by essentially, you know, one company builds them and one company designs them. Um, there are like two or three companies in the world that are involved, and it wouldn't be very difficult to control that pipeline of chips so that, um, and change those chips so that they, they, you know, you wouldn't be able to use them unless you have a license, let's say. So like, you know, you install the software and if you don't type the right keys, you can't use them, but it could be at the hardware level, so it wouldn't be easy to hack that. So if that was the case, then anybody who has those chips would have to basically get uh, some permission to, to, to run, to use them for running AI systems. So, these could be ways to enforce, uh, and we need to be creative. Like, I don't know the answers, but we need to think about them, and experts from many domains, from you know, uh, the, the more technical to the more social, uh, need to be involved in, in thinking about these things. There may be time for one more important questions. question. So thank you. Well, we have another technology which is very uh, dangerous and could kill us very easily and very quickly, and that's nuclear weapons. Yeah. And we have, uh, we have had them for a, a while, but it hasn't happened yet. Yes. So is there any lesson that one can learn from that? A lot, yes, yes. Um, one thing I, I, I uh, learned uh, just last year that is extremely interesting and goes back to the previous question. Just after the Second World War, um, the Americans realized that the Russians were building their own uh, nuclear weapons and it wouldn't be long before the nuclear conflicts could emerge. And in a way, everyone was scared of what could happen. And the Americans proposed to the United Nations and to uh, USSR what's called the Baruch Plan, the name of the person who wrote the plan. And the plan was to stop developing nuclear weapons, uh, you know, each of us separately, each country, and instead have like one United Nations organization uh, do that with all, you know, the research being pulled together and also the you know, nuclear material and so on uh, to minimize the risks of uh, ending up into nuclear Armageddon with the, the race to, uh, you know, dominate the other and so on. So it's interesting because when there's an existential risk, uh, we could be willing to give away a lot of sovereignty. We, I mean, countries, you know, even, even though the United States was leading at that time, uh, you know, they were in advance of several years with uh, the Russians, um, they understood that it would be temporary. And, and it's the same thing with AI right now. The, the Americans are leading, but the Chinese are maybe like one year you know, behind, and uh, it's not going to be forever that, that, that they have that lead. So, there's hope. And yes, we, we can definitely take lessons from history. There are lots of people who have been involved over the last few decades in nuclear negotiations, non-proliferation agreements, and I think a lot of these apply. Now, there are also big differences, but, but I think that we can learn lessons. So I'm really sorry we're running out of time, uh, but I'm really grateful. Uh, I think one of the reasons that you uh, called for stop uh, developing further AI is such that you have time to come to the University of Vienna and to give <laughs> such talks. Um, uh, I think this. I didn't. I didn't say to stop AI. To stop only the you know the the the, the, the top uh, frontier systems because there are lots of lots of good things we can do with the more normal AI systems. Yeah. Um, I, I have to say this evening will be very memorable to me. I hope uh, that you all agree that it's also going to be very memorable to you. We were thinking about what could be memorable to you to take away, <laughs> and we have, uh, we have come up with four items. Um, and so uh, I have to say um, one of them is the black gold of Austria, otherwise known as pumpkin seed oil, <laughs> which I have come to uh, really appreciate. Um, you cannot only put it on salads, you can actually drink it as is and it's fantastic. The other one uh, is the yellow gold of Austria, 
which is actually apricot juice. Ooh, um, which never is tried that. Really amazing. Uh, the other thing, uh, though, is uh, chocolate. Um, Totter chocolate, specifically, it's it's very special. My friends in Canada uh, love it. Really, <laughs> they love it, and uh, I'm sure you'll find people. Uh, around you that love it. I know that you have your issues with chocolate. And the other thing is, I think um, the uh, uh, there is a cup, uh, a water bottle uh, from the University of Vienna that yeah. hopefully reminds you of the amazing talents that are growing out of the universities uh, and also the University of Vienna. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, you very much again. And please join me in saying thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.